So this is the video for the section 1.1 of the ITCSE Marine Syllabus. I am going to be using the new textbook from Cambridgeshire as the source material for most here in the videos. But as always, it's a very good idea when you're working with any Cambridge class to look what is stated in the syllabus because the syllabus is the foundation of everything we should do when we teach a subject in Cambridge. So look at the um, syllabus here and you'll see what we need to cover and of course the book goes into a little more detail but you'll always find you know the big lines of what needs to be taught here so it's time to get started with the IDCSC marine syllabus and we might imagine that we have to start with the structure of water ocean water molecules and so on but actually we're starting with our place in the solar system now we are so lucky that our planet the earth is what we call the goldilocks zone if we were closer to the sun it'll be too hot and we wouldn't have any liquid water if it'll be further away from the sun it'll be too cold and most of the water would be frozen so for us to have a blue planet uh, to have marine life we need to be just the right distance from the sun and that we are um, this is going to um, have a huge impact in section 1.4 but another important thing is gravity so the Sun is the biggest object in our solar system and then we have the Earth and both the Earth and the Sun pull on each other with gravity but since the Sun is bigger it pulls harder and it keeps us in place and keeps us spinning around the Sun I know if you go into pure Einstein stuff there's more to it than that but for here just think about gravity make us go in circles around the Sun and the same way we go around the Sun we have the moon orbiting us as a satellite here so because of this structure here um, a lot of things when we talk about tides when we talk about currents when we talk about wind systems will make a lot more sense when you think about this so this is the first part so the earth spins on its axis at an angle of about 23.5 degrees uh, that means that the earth is not like this compared to the sun it's slightly tilted and this case here it means the southern part of the ball which we call the southern hemisphere gets more light than the northern part the northern hemisphere this is the condition when we have summer in the south and winter in the north down here on what would be Antarctica um, as we keep turning there will be light at all times so we will have a summer where the Sun doesn't go down on the other hand up here in the Arctic northern Greenland and so on every time we'll turn will still be dark so it will be like dark for a few months the places that get the most energy here in the middle is the equator so this is usually where we have the most heat and the most energy as the sun then keep, keeps shining and we keep spinning around we will get to the other side and the tilt will be different so it will be the same but the position toward the sun will be different so we now have more energy come to the northern hemisphere so now we have summer in the north and winter in the south so this uh, tilt here is what makes us have the different seasons and this is of course very important uh, for us uh, understanding everything from sea current to sea ice to the effects of global warming I do apologize for just using a basketball but that was what I could find at this time so just as the earth orbits the Sun we also have the moon orbiting earth um, again quite a bad model here but you get it and it takes about 30 days for a cycle here to be complete and same time of course the earth is spinning um, as um, the moon is quite closer to the earth than the sun is although it has much smaller mass than the sun its rotational pull is still big enough to have a huge huge influence on tides and we'll talk about that in section 1.4 So the Earth is a rocky planet 
but the rock is only solid near the surface. Um, as you see here, we have a picture of a cross section of the Earth and showing the solid rock at the surface. It's a thin layer we call the crust. The crust beneath the ocean has a great density and varies in thickness from like uh, 3 to 10 kilometers. Continental crust has a lower density, but is way thicker, up to 35 to 40 kilometers, although it can be as thick as 100 kilometers. Beneath the crust we have the mantle, which is made of like a very thick molten rock, uh, we call magma. It has a viscous mass, so it's not like you know water, it's more like porridge. And as we get Closer in, we have the inner and outer core. Uh, the outer core is made of molten iron, and the inner core is made of solid iron. Now, this has a huge effect on uh, our marine system for several reasons. This is why earthquake happens, this is why volcanoes happen. We'll talk about that in the next section, 1.2. It's also important because um, it means our entire planet is still alive, it's still moving, and the iron inside creates a magnetic field. This magnetic field has a huge impact on life on Earth, especially life on the surface, uh, because it helps protect from um, radiation from space. But it's also, for many animals, both marine and terrestrial, it's a way to navigate, knowing which is north and which is south. So when we have animals migrating over large distance, like uh, seagulls, uh, other migratory birds, um, sea turtles, um, they can use the magnetic field as a guideline to finding distance. So it's important to know that our planet is only like the other thinner layer, which is like hard. And it, it's, it's a bit weird to think about <clears throat> if again I use my, my basketball here. We have this thin layer, like if I took a coat of paint and painted my basketball, I won't. That this will be the layer of the Earth that we can live. If you go any further up, pressure is too low, oxygen pressure is too low, too cold. If you go any further down, it's too warm, full radi radiation and molten rock. So we are very, very lucky that just here on the surface, we are again in a Goldilocks zone. Not too warm, not too cold, so life can exist. Thank you. On the last page here of the video, I have listed some of the keywords that the guidebook here has stated as keywords. If you're not used to doing Cambridge classes, keywords is important. Uh, Cambridge like to use these keywords in the question for the exam. And if you're not used to using scientific English, learning these keywords is a huge part of learning any Cambridge syllabus. So I do suggest you take the time and take a piece of paper and try to note down uh, your definition of all these keywords. I spoke about most of it here in the video. If not, it's my mistake, not the syllabuses. Um, and try to note down what they mean. It will be a tremendous benefit for you in learning Cambridge. Thank you for hanging along and we'll follow up soon with section 1.2.